warm welcome to you all from we here at the women's show that is going to be airing on Citizens TV. For many of you who will be watching, you probably already heard about um, the Citizens chat that happens every Thursday. And so we have brought yet another product to you, courtesy of the Center for Constitutional Governance. And this is a purely uh, a purely female or women's program. So it's a program that will build and look at the issues that affect women in this country, but also women globally. We'll be delving into issues of policy. We'll be delving into issues of how to strengthen women's participation in different processes in the country. And we hope that you'll be able to join us on a weekly basis. So I'd like you to log into your calendars and just make it a date to be with us every Tuesday right here on Citizens TV. So today uh, is our inaugural show. And on our inaugural show, we have two segments. And uh, these two segments are going to basically be looking at the women's movement. And I know that ca uh, quite a number of you might be saying, but this is a cliche conversation. It might be cliche, but you think, see the thing with movement building is that movement building has been likened to a train ride, you know? And there are people who are on that journey and have been moving on for about 30 kilometers. But along those 30 kilometers, there are different stops. And after those 30 kilometers, there are different stops. So every day on this journey of movement building, the, we have new women coming on board. We have new thought lines coming on board. We have new perspectives being interrogated. And so the conversation around movement building might sound cliche, but every time we discuss or have a conversation around it, there's new and emerging things that are always available to us. So today, because this is an inaugural women's show, it's important that we ground it within the context of the women's movement. And joining me today are two impeccable women. One of them is Sarah Birete, who you have already met on the Citizens Chat. <laughs> yes, but today she's joining us, one, because um, she's the executive director of the Center for Constitutional Governance, and they are passionate about women's issues. And she will be joining us to also show you that she's not all about everything else you know her for, but yeah, she's also all about the women. And that is why this show is important. So Sarah, you're very much welcome. Thank you, Isabella, and the good afternoon viewers. Also joining us is Rachel Wanyana. Rachel is a program manager, program officer in charge of policy and research at the Uganda Women's Network. And you're very much welcome, Rachel. Thank you, Yes, Isabella. You're welcome. So going straight into the conversation, I would like to come to Rachel and Sarah and ask you to give our viewers a little bit of understanding. Let's go back into the history of the women's movement, especially in Uganda, because again, the women's movement today is at times confused to be just about women in civil society. So can we go back to the history of the movement and just shed light onto that for our viewers? Rachel, do you want to go okay. first? Okay, I will. Yeah. Uh, first of all, Isabella, I think uh, when we are talking about the women's movement, it is important to acknowledge that what we always refer to as the women's movement is in fact the modern women's movement, mm. which started uh, during the colonial times. But even before uh, colonialism, the women were organizing, women were playing a very critical role in the social economic and even the political aspects of their communities, though it was within more informal organizing or structures, so to say. But I will talk uh, more to the modern women's movement because it is what has been mostly documented yeah. in Uganda. Mm -hmm. And uh, the seeds of this particular movement were mostly, started to be mostly visible in around 19, the 1940s. Mm -hmm. uh, they particularly started with the Mother's Union, which is the female league or the women's league of the Church of Uganda, and also other associations that, like the Young Women uh, Christian Association. Yes, YMCA. Yes, mm -hmm. and they were mostly um, fostering or promoting or working on issues of girls' education, uh, safe motherhood, uh, livelihoods, you know, a woman having uh, rights in the event that the marriage is dissolved. 
and, that, and, and those the, the issues mostly they were social mm. and economic. And then in 1946, that's when the boost came. Mm. Particularly, there is a young woman who was dis disposed of her marital property because she lost her husband. So the relatives took the property. And the women under the Mothers' Union, under the Young Women Christian Association, mm. they mobilized and they came together and they stormed the bishop's home in Namirembe. <laughs> and uh, what happened is that they were joined by other women, the Indian women, who also were protesting the way they were treated within their culture. And they, they galvanized a lot of uh, energy. They were very visible, they were very disruptive, they were very vocal. And this led to the formation of the Uganda Council of Women, mm. which also we know that it was very uh, central in the nomination of the first women in the legal. Mm. I, I don't know, maybe I can, I can leave it there because it's a very long history because yes. from there we see the women now, they have entered the political space mm. and they are pushing for, uh, in Lancaster, when we were negotiating for our independence in Lancaster, these women, uh, Francis Akello, uh, our own Joyce uh, Mpanga, Mpanga. Yeah. and there is Makumbi, Eseza Makumbi, I think Makumbi. They were very central in these negotiations, though history at somehow has managed to, you know, yes. er erase, er erase contribution, their contribution. Yeah. So we see the women in the political spaces right into uh, 19, the 1960s after independence when Obote takes over power. And of course, as you know, the complexities and the dynamics that come with, you know, uh, th that came with that period. Mm -hmm. People were trying to, to, to keep on to what is theirs. Mm -hmm. They were trying to protect their space or, you know, the, it, it was more of selfish political preservation. And then we see uh, women being labeled as foreign, uh, the women of the Uganda council are uh, being claimed as foreign funded. They are again going against the morals, the cultural traditions. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, the women's movement became, I think it, I can say it was hijacked mm -hmm. by political interests. And now the leading political party yes. started its own women's rights organization, <laughs> which was led by the first lady. Mm -hmm. Of course, now we know that the agency is lost. Mm. So the women are organizing now in secretive kinds of ways. So the suppression has begun. And now as we go into Idi Amin, with, uh, you know, with all that is associated, the drama that is associated with that, with that uh, regime, already the women's movement was facing, so it was already weakened. Mm. And when he came up with the Decree 3 in 1978, it established that the Uganda Women's Council was not uh, a legal organization. So they had to seize any official kind of organizing. And this saw us again go back to the, what I'll call the underground, underground kind of working. Oh God, and it's yeah. the young women, I think I should point this out. It's the young women who kept pushing the women's movement in these hard times. Mm -hmm. The Young Women Christian Association, they kept organizing, they kept mobilizing, but uh, generally on the mainstream, the women's movement had been disenfranchised, that it had been curtailed. And I can go on, I can jump from Amin's uh, time to come to 1980, the, the 1980s, mm -hmm. where we are also seeing the global women's movement uh, being very influential in Uganda and in Africa. And it acted as that spark that we needed, that reignited the women's movement. Many times people say that maybe the power of the women's movement that we have witnessed over the years was because of the NRM government. Yeah. But th that cannot be any, any, any more wrong or any more true, I don't know, yeah. It is not very true. Because even in coming, the NRM government didn't have a gender policy. Yeah. But it rode on the aspirations, on the objectives, on the goals of the women who were already organizing mm. to feed into its narrative that it's a government that is promoting women, freedom. Yes. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's, that's basically the journey uh, uh, of, of the women's movement in Uganda. I think maybe Sarah is better <laughs> placed to talk about it from the 1980s mm. uh, going forward, and I will let her pick up from there. Thank you very oh. much, Rachel. And as Sarah comes in, of course, you talk about the hijack of the movement, but you also talk about the, the fact that it 
that it has it, that it evolved yes. and which means that even today it continues to, to evolve, evolve. Yes. and uh, we just got out of the speakership race you know yeah. <laughs> we just got out of the speakership race and it was brutal it brutal, was bloody yeah. and i think it's one of those things that it's one of those things that i should say could have split okay not really split but it caused it caused fault lines within even the women's movement mm -hmm. about the support or not to support the um, the speakership mm -hmm. so coming to sarah in case there are things that you would like to carry on from rachel's conversation please do but in proceeding what are some of the fault lines that we okay, no, not even fault lines but what are some of the aspects in which the the women's movement has evolved into that we see right now and what are some of the ways that, it, that that evolving has manifested itself? And do we have opportunities within that evolving? Or is there a further weakening of the movement that we ought to pay more attention to it? Yes, over okay. to you, Sarah. Yeah, thank you very much, Isabella. I want to, you know, in agreement with my co-panelist, Rachel, just adding aspects of the women movement in the traditional society setup. Yeah. There were key roles that women were playing, like in a home and food, ensuring food security. The concept of granaries, the role of women in the garden, ensuring there is meal on table in a traditional family setup was a duty of women. Men would come in, here and there are those who are working, but on a few things. Because where you have a family, having subsistence farming, 90% of the food on table was the duty and credit of a woman. I know that land, you know, land ownership issues have taken away that role and put at risk mm. the, the food security and the granary concept that is attributed to women. We also have, you know, on, uh, though on the bad side, but the women inheritance, mm. that was a bad culture mm. on the side of women, but how the women now played in that. Because the, 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 the concentration of a woman would be like a, an orphan young woman. Mm. The concentration would be, I want to raise my children. Mm. Then in that sacrifice or commitment, then the family chooses a husband for you. Mm. Somebody you have no feelings for, somebody you have, but you mm. focus on raising your family. Mm. I know that now there is space and many women are overcoming that first inheritance, but that bad practice still exists in some less developed sections of our society. And later it came in with diseases like HIV, AIDS and the rest that helped stop the vice, but some cultures still have that bad practice and it's a, it will go into part of our challenges yes. for the women movement. We had a, an era of organized marriages. They still happen in one way or the other, a bit polished, but the women <laughs> movement worked around that mm. to promote the issue and importance of consent, yes. to allow women fall in love, not because you have been chosen by a male, mm. but to make your own decision in a relationship and who you want to have as a partner in your life. So the, the, there is some progress in that aspect. But there are some forms also of arranged marriages that are happening, for good or bad, and we shall address them at challenge level. <laughs> we have uh, the, the, the women food security concept has transited a bit in the circle, circle phenomenon, mm. or, or uh, Evivina, I don't know what to call them. Evivina, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. Still, women are, are focusing on ensuring that there is stability in a home and there is food for their children. A very big role they are playing. Yeah. We have uh, the, trans the journey on women and land rights. Mm. You know, before it was a taboo for a woman to, to own land. And there was a process because women were the ones utilizing land for agriculture, mm. for both subsistence and commercial. Even where we had regions gazetted as like East produces cotton, there is a coffin in the Elgon region, still it was the woman tilling land. But a woman working 100% on land that they can never own. 
So that journey of women and land rights moved up to the level of Kalema report in the Legiko mm. and the strides they achieved at least to enable, but it is still a big hurdle yeah. because up to today, uh, only uh, an estimate of 30% women own land in their names. So we have that challenge of women ownership, women inheritance of land. When you get married, you are in disinherited from your family. Where you are married, you are a stranger and you are also yeah. disinherited. <laughs> so those are some of the challenges that we are moving with. As much as we have laws now that like the Succession Amendment Act mm -hmm. that tries to mitigate those factors, but we know that there is a big difference between law and practice. Mm. So the sensitization that is needed, the education and empowerment mm. on the side of women who work 100% on the land that they never own. Mm. So we, we have another challenge of women in education. I know that the, the, the wave of affirmative action tried to provide that aspect for a girl child to make sure they are in school and they are kept in school. But before that, it was a taboo in most families to educate a, a, a girl child. Mm. Parents used to look at girl child education as a wastage of school fees, wastage of investment, because you're going to get married anyway and move away. Mm. And yet we know that when you educate a woman, you educate a nation. So, but the two concepts had no relationship at all. So you had parents thinking that they should educate their boys. Whenever there was a challenge with school fees, the girl stays at home. Whenever a family had no money, then the girl never steps in school. Or even when you finish one level of education, now you can read and write and read signposts, go and get married. We are not going to waste fees. So that mentality took time to go away. And we had the, you know, the people who, who opened roads for the others, the likes of Dr. Sarantiro, mm. the likes of the first, you know, first woman educator, first woman engineer, first, mm -hmm. and, and they really created a path for so many other women to access education. But mm. it has been a long struggle to the extent that some families still don't send their girls to school. Mm -hmm. Or even when there's a slight challenge, then it's the girl to drop out. Mm -hmm. And now the COVID pandemic, as we are speaking in our masks, COVID pandemic has affected so many girls, those that were defiled during lockdown, mm -hmm. the majority that are pregnant, and the education policies, like the latest development by UNEB, where they said that they will not allow pregnant girls because of the challenges of, give, of taking care of them at schools, giving birth in exams and the mm. rest, which is a bit regressive because at the, at the opening of easing of lockdown, UNEB came forward and said they will al allow preg pregnant girls to sit their exams. Mm. Then later towards the end, they said they will not allow it again. So you have a victim of a society through defilement and mm. many families don't even get justice. Yeah. And the majority of girls are unfortunately defiled by people who are meant to protect them, including their fathers, their brothers, their uncles. These are the majority defilers of, of a girl child. Mm. So you have victimization of society and family, but also victimization of education policies now to jeopardize your future mm. because you are fallen victim of a crime in our society, which is very unfortunate. Yeah. We have now in the era of women in the boardrooms, in the era of the 1980s. Mm. It started with the Nairobi meeting in 1993 that mm. prepared for the much talked about Beijing platform, where the, you know, the Azenarium came from the, <laughs> the bush. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> in our times. <laughs> <laughs> As the bush dwellers <laughs> came to town. Oh, <laughs> yes. So they found women organizing. Yeah. For Uganda, we had agencies like, I, I think the most popular then was Ackford. Even FIDA. FIDA, but there was also other, you know, like Mother's Union, mm -hmm. other women's spaces. Mm -hmm. So immediately, the NRM came to power. They found these women already active and discussing these things, and they embraced the agenda, which was very good. Because that first leadership was important mm. at, at the highest political levels. Mm. 
So they embraced the agenda and women were enabled to travel with the government support to the Nairobi meeting mm. and later to Beijing, where we had a very powerful education a, a delegation, sorry, mm. led by the then vice president, Dr. Specioza Kazube. The Beijing meeting was chaired by the likes of Hillary Clinton as the first lady of the U.S. then, mm -hmm. and many other powerful women. But for Africa, I think we, ha we had the highest mm -hmm. level of political representation, because by then, Dr. Speciosa Kazbe was the only vi female vice president in Africa, mm -hmm. and she was the first mm -hmm. female vice president in Africa. So we had that powerful presence. Many women who were already active participated, the likes of Dr. Miriam Atemba and many other remarkable women leaders. We, through the Beijing platform and the political leadership that was already existing in Uganda, they embraced the women agenda in our constitution. And it is part of chapter four of the fundamental rights and freedoms mm. that should not be delegated upon, you know, derogated upon by any state agents or act of the state. Mm. Those provisions in Article 31, 32 and 33 of the Constitution provide for affirmative action, provide for rights of a family, provide for education and other, other elements of women empowerment and mainstreaming, mm. but the other components are in the specific legislations or acts of parliament. So from there we are able to have women in local councils, like there's an article for a third provision of local councils in the constitution. Mm. And the struggle did not stop at that. We had the African Union, New Union Constitutive Act, which provides for gender parity in articles two and three of the African Union Constitutive Act. And now agenda 2063 of the African Union, inspiration six is for gender parity, 50-50 women-men representation in all spheres of decision-making and political leadership. I know Uganda is, has not attained its gender parity quota as much as we are celebrated as a leadership that embraced women empowerment at the earlier stages. We are still far below, even achieving a third representation even in cabinet is a struggle. Mm. The outgoing cabinet had 27.3% women. Mm. It fell short of even a third, and we are yet to dream of gender parity in Uganda's political leadership. Mm. We have the women MPs in parliament, but they still constitute about 30% of the house are they more actually i think they this time around they are more than the men if i'm well informed it's something that we can no. get as we go forward yeah it? we are going to find it uh, yeah mm -hmm. they are not more than men mm -hmm. i don't yes they are not more than men <laughs> they are not <laughs> if we are lucky we will have a third or slightly above a third but we are not more than men because we have few women who came on open seats and mm. a one per district cannot mm. be more than men when you have the other seats taken by taken men, by men. about four or five in a district. Okay, it's something yeah. that will establish. Yes, mm. yes. So we used to have one woman in the outgoing government as a lead of one arm of government. We have since lost that. Mm. The current composition of leaders of the respective arms of government are all male the president, the chief justice, and the speaker of parliament are all male. In the outgoing government, we had two women in the top 20 women mm. political leadership in this country. For now, we are only counting one woman, the <laughs> deputy speaker, who is number nine in mm. position of hierarchy mm. of this country. So if we do not get a vice president who is female, and that is a number two position, or we don't get a prime minister who is female, mm. we shall not have a woman leader in the top eight positions in this country. Mm. And there are only two vacancies of vice president and prime minister. And through this show, I want to call upon President Museveni, you embraced the women empowerment agenda at your area stages of leadership, Uganda should not lag behind 
in East Africa, in Africa and mm. globally, when you are still the same person in power, we still want to believe that you're committed mm. to the cause of women and making them equal citizens, including e giving them equal representation mm. in your cabinet. On the East African sphere, Rwanda is number three globally mm. in attaining gender parity, and they have 63% mm. women in leadership positions as a government. And they are number three globally, number one in Africa. Mm. Tanzania has a female president. Yes. It has raised the agenda yeah. empowerment statistics. And Kenya has a female chief justice. So they also have a woman leader mm. as one of the leaders of the three arms of government. Uganda is lagging behind now on that front, even at the East African level. But when you go to the corporations, women in corporations, mm. women in the business sector, women generally in boardrooms taking important decisions, there is some progress, but we are still below the 50% required for gender parity. Mm. Another remarkable progress we need to accredit to the people who, you know, who laid the path for this great movement in Uganda is mm. the re Resolution 1325 yeah. that includes women in peace building and peacemaking processes mm. at the topmost level of the UN. Mm. That process started with the women in Burundi struggling to be part of the peace and we know women are natural peacekeepers. They have always helped when they are brought on table to resolve conflicts. And the women in Burundi led by the late Mwari Munyerere contacted Uganda because Uganda was ranking highly in embracing women inclusion and empowerment. Mm. And by then the Vice President, Dr. Speciosa Kazube, together with Mwari Mnyerere, lobbied and caused the enactment of Resolution 1325 for women involvement in peacemaking, peace building and peace settlement processes. Mm. And we thank them for that effort. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that elaborate uh, <laughs> submission. <laughs> and uh, maybe at this point, the viewers may be saying, eh, but this movement building has become very complicated. This women's <laughs> movement has become very complicated. So coming back to Rachel, you work with the Uganda Women's Movement. It's, uh, I mean, Uganda Women's Network. And it's a network organization that brings on board um, various shades of women's institutions and groupings. For people who may find the political and the policy and the law very intense and saying if that is the only way we are going to engage with the women's movement, then we are not going to. What are, what are some of the spaces, what are some of the other spaces that the, movement, that the women's movement is making, is, is making strides in mm. if we are to look at the extent to which it has evolved currently? Mm. Yes. Okay, our, first of all, well, thank you very much, Sarah. <laughs> yes, a big thank you. Oh, wow. I yes. think these are things that should be taught in our schools or even put Someone on UBC. Got rid of civil mm. education, but anyway. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think I think one thing uh, that maybe Sarah might might not have mentioned mm. is the progress that we have made yeah. in policies, particularly addressing violence against women. women. Yes, we've yes. heard the GBV Act, we've heard the FGM Act. Same yes. Oh <laughs> <laughs> the gender based violence, violence act, act. Mm. the female, female genital, genital mutilation act. Mm. And then also there is one on uh, trafficking of persons mm. which mostly also affects women mm. and mostly young women between the ages of nineteen and mm. twenty five. Mm. Are some of the spaces where people can engage with the women's yes, movement? Where the women's movement is mm. still like is mm. still visible because there are people who will say, but the mm. women, th I'm a woman, but this thing looks far away from mm. me. So what mm. are some of the spaces that, mm. I think okay, if someone said, where do I find where the women's I find movement? The women's yes. Okay, first of all, even, even, even that question in itself, <laughs> you know, many times we already say that the women's movement is we. Yes. Many times it has been attributed to organizations, it has been attributed to individuals, you know, particular individuals. They speak for the movement, mm -hmm. so they are the movement. Mm -hmm. But then the, the, the movement is people like me, like Isabella, like Sarah, mm -hmm. who are doing 
work that is contributing towards mm -hmm. the gender equality and women empowerment you know goal mm -hmm. we call those the women's movement mm -hmm. i think maybe i can uh, just give a little explanation of uh the women's movement because again many times when we are talking about how do i be part of mm -hmm. the movement we are accused of being elitist. Yeah. You know, we work in Kampala. We are in air air conditioned buildings. Nice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. But then one of the core objectives of the women's movement, mm. even as it was starting, was sisterhood and mm. inclusivity. Yeah. Actually, organizations like Oxford, when they came back from what Sarah told us, the mm. Nairobi Forum, yes. they came back and the people whom they reached out to first were the women at the grassroots. Mm. Even that, now, now that, that, that term is being called problematic, but women in the communities, mm. the women who were engaged in the farming, the women mm. who were stay-at-home mothers, mm. these were women who were engaged. And particularly their focus mm. was raising awareness a building awareness of the women. Mm -hmm. And then they worked with organizations like FIDA to uh, build legal awareness because most of the issues that have affected women mostly have been issues of access to justice mm -hmm. because they were not uh, catered for in the formal legal uh, you know, uh, structures or let's say the laws when it comes to land issues, when it comes to issues of rights within marriage, when it comes to issues of FGM violence, but then also knowing the different challenges that come around with a woman interfacing with the, you know, the justice system. So they focused or in legal representation and creating awareness. Mm -hmm. And for me, these ways in which they engaged with the women mm -hmm. speak to how we can be engaged with the women's movement. Yes. From where you are in your village, mm -hmm. creating awareness about gender equality and women's empowerment, saying women deserve equal opportunities and equal rights, just mm -hmm. like men. Yes. That is one way you can contribute to the movement, even without being part of Uganda Women's Network mm -hmm. or even being part of... Uh, Any civil society. Yes, of Forward. Yeah. I love the fact that now CCG has this space and mm -hmm. they have dedicated a time to, you know, the women's... talking about women's issues. Mm -hmm. Because CCC, CCG would not be normally counted as part of the women's movement. Mm, it yes. is a mainstream organization. Yes, yes. But this speaks to the fact that we can create, or we can create spaces. It is such a fluid kind of society. The women's movement is fluid, it's mm. dynamic. So we define it according to our lived realities and our needs. Mm. I love that what Femfort is doing, yes. movement building, but mostly from the feminist point of view, mm. challenging patriarchy, mm. building capacities of women to be mm. able to, you know, to address or even to cause about systemic changes. Mm. And those are the different ways we can engage. Uh, at the policy level, of course, <laughs> there, there, there are certain structures like the, the UOPA, Uganda Women's uh, Movement, Forward, uh, that are taking lead in that. And sometimes we need these organizations. Yes. Mm -hmm. We need them because we need an organized kind of corporate body mm -hmm. to be able to strategically influence at the national level. But then we should not limit the women's movement to these corporate, I'm calling them corporate, corporate bodies, yeah. mm. to these corporate bodies. Mm. We should own should the be, movement. It's, it's I, I, I think that's the key thing. I cannot mm. even define what the women's movement should be. But maybe the core value should be that we are pushing for the equality of all women. All women. We are pushing for inclusivity. And that leads me to speak to uh, the bill that, that was recently passed mm. and how exclusionary it yeah. was. Leaving out some kinds that's of it. women. Yeah. And that gives you an opportunity to I don't know, to contribute to the movement, mm. so to say, to contribute to the movement in that particular aspect, saying no. Mm. As the women's movement, we stand for inclusivity. Mm. These women have been left behind. Yes, we appreciate the corporate organizations for the role that they played in representing and pushing for the passage of these uh, particular bills. Mm. But then can we maybe revise it? Can we sit back and call for a revision, can we make inclusivity <laughs> more of a reality than something that we just love to, you know, to talk about? Because many times we talk about the things, but when it comes to uh, putting them in practice, we say we postpone that maybe 
we have achieved this. So maybe we can work on that tomorrow. So yeah. that, yeah. <laughs> and maybe yeah. talking about the sexual offences bill, to the two of you really, mm. if the president came and asked you if he should sign off on it, mm. what would your response be? You know, the law gives the president <laughs> a chance. <laughs> the law gives the president yes. a chance yes. to yes. advise parliament mm. the first time a bill is passed yes. and bounce it back to mm. say, pay more attention mm. to clauses B3 and, and 4. Mm. So the president did express that he's not comfortable signing the bill in its current form. And I am playing that he bounces it back mm -hmm. and indicate to those specific clauses that he's not comfortable with because as a fountain of honor, he's now the honorary Ugandan with that privilege. The law is very important. Mm. It has a good aspect, mm. but it has gaps that are critical to sections of women. Mm. So I am playing hard that the president sends the bill back to parliament. Parliament will resume official business. Mm this week and uh, highlighting those clauses that need reconsideration by parliament mm. and if parliament bounces back the bill in its current form then he chooses either to sign it or not mm. and if he time lapses before he signs mm. the bill bounces back to parliament, parliament. Okay. and once then if parliament confirms that mm. those are the components of the law that they want as a legislative body because the function to make laws does not belong to the president. Mm. It belongs to parliament. So we, if parliament confirms on the thir for the third time that that is the law, then it becomes automatically the law, mm. either with the president's signature or assent or not. Mm. So there, now the movement, we need to come in and highlight those issues where we think there are gaps mm. and we can reconcile and have reconsideration by parliament. Mm. Also send a memo to the president and say these are the issues. Mm. Please reconsider. Mm. Send the same memo to parliament and say mm. these are the re issues. This is the justification. Please reconsider. Yeah. And then we, we, we see if they can reconsider or not. We have mm. that opportunity. So, but it's a, it's a largely, all is not lost, mm -hmm. but we lost some critical aspects that create discrimination and exclusion mm. of particular sections of society. Mm. So we need to be alive as advocates of, of women inclusion, equality and empowerment mm. to also to act, with, strategize and act within the gaps yeah. to ensure that those gaps are, are addressed. Mm. Mm -hmm. Rachel, thank you very much, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think for me particularly, if I were to, if the president were to <laughs> ask, ask me, yes, yes. I, I think first of all, uh, the fact that we lost the uh, the section or the sorry, the, the clause, on yeah, on consent, yeah, this was very makes critical. yeah, it makes the very whole critical. bill lose meaning in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Because if we remove consent from a law on sexual offences, on, on, on sexual offences, then what is that? Mm -hmm. But then someone can say that we have consent catered for in the penal code, mm -hmm. and this is where we've been challenged many times. And maybe we can have a, a conversation on this, because many times we are accused of proposing laws. That which already dilute mm. already existing laws. Yeah. And maybe this is where, again, we need more technical, to build our technical know-how, knowledge, you know, to be mm. able to contribute meaningfully mm. in ways that we do not patronize ourselves. Mm. Because <laughs> this bill, they will tell you that we engaged with stakeholders. Yes. We engaged with the women's movement. Yes. I was one of uh, the people who engaged with more than 80 members of parliament in Mukono for mm. three days. Yes. You know, we reviewed the bill close, close, by, close. by close. Mm. And I remember still these issues were very contentious even mm. then. Issues of consent, issues of continuous consent particularly. Mm. And even women, even women, women parliamentarians were against the issue of continuous consent. Mm. They said, if I have come from the bathroom, I have undressed, 
and the man has undressed and he is ready. I can't torture him. I can't, you know, like subject him to that torture of denying him. Yes. So the, 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 the issue of continuous consent could not be... But, but it, continuous mm. consent means during the act. Du yes. yes. Du it is not it, it at starts, the beginning it starts, of no, I, we have already we, ha we have already agreed. And Let's you are go. engaged. <laughs> yes, it, but it's, you know, continuous... Our consent, yes, it starts from the time that we say we are going to do mm. this act. Mm. Then you can go and buy beers, you can come back, and I can reject, I can refuse. Or you can go looking for condoms and you come back when I've changed my mind. Mm. So it's not necessarily That's limited okay. only. Uh, yeah, yes. But when, what became contentious mm. was during. Is the one during the process. <laughs> you have agreed, agreed, you have prepared, and you have started. <laughs> You have taken off. And then somebody says, stop, stop, stop. Mm. So where is the landing pad? Mm. Where is, you know, the... the but I think that was what mm. became contentious. Yes. But so I think we need mm. to strategize. Mm. Yeah. You know, in legal making, there is mm. what we call legal host trading. Mm -hmm. So we need to know what are the worries of mm. the other people. Where is the middle ground? The middle ground? So that we meet each other halfway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The, I, I really do appreciate that. It's kindly, Isabella, let me add yes, a little on this. Mm. I think this issue also, uh, it brought out the need to build, uh, you know, like for the maybe the women's movement to be able to work closely or build linkages, mm -hmm. vertical and horizontal linkages mm -hmm. with the women in parliament, yeah. but then also with the women at the grassroots. Yes, yes. Because many times why we are accused of being elitist is that people do not appreciate mm -hmm. how really these, you know, uh, propositions that we are making affect them. Mm -hmm. We sound like very inhumane people, some entitled people, like you know, like what, what Sarah is talking about. You're already like in the act. Mm. Yes, how insensitive can you be? So we need to build a <laughs> common ground. <laughs> we need to build a common ground that as, was the, the event. <laughs> as the women's movement. But also, yeah. but, but also away, away from um, probably away from the legal, mm. is to say that maybe we need to normalize conversations around consent. Yes, because usually when we talk about consent people think that the only thing you're talking about is rape you know mm. and okay like, it actually is, is is the rape of someone found you in an alley and, and they grabbed you and they scratched you <laughs> and they yeah. but we, we we rarely talk about consent within the context of it happens with with, with someone that i was comfortable with but more importantly the far etching effect and impact mm. of unwanted sex on, unwanted on, sex. on someone's yes. emotional yes. state yes. you know mm. and so it I, th I think it's important that we, we're not saying that that, that that we're not just having a conversation around the five or ten minutes of pleasure mm. but you're having it around the effects that this has mm. on the person whose consent mm. was not given and it can be a woman mm. or a man, a man yes. you know and, and on mm. the, uh, because also the conversation around consent usually is just about the woman but yeah. it's also to say that even men have the right to withhold consent. Mm, yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Let, let that's, me that's, share. That's, mm. There was a case even before yeah. the bill came up, mm -hmm. and we need to build this conversation also into the ma marriage the and divorce, divorce bill mm. because yes. there were the, they are similar arguments. Mm. But before even this bill came up, there was a, a case at Uganda Road mm. in the mid 2000s. Mm. On a, people had they traveled for a workshop, mm. and they decided to indulge themselves. Mm. So in the middle of the act, the woman remembered that she's married. And then said, yes. <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> Those are facts in the case. In the no, she remembered. <laughs> yes. yes. That she said, was I am not, I'm married. I'm not supposed <laughs> to be doing this. The yeah. And then she told her partner, stop, stop. Mm. I don't feel comfortable cheating on my mm. husband. So the other partner did not stop. So mm. did not stop. And mm. when she came back, she lodged a complaint in court mm. of rape. Mm. So she said, from the time I told you to stop, and whatever business continued after that, <laughs> it was without my consent. Mm. Yes. And you raped me, and he, she was psychologically tortured. Mm. Yes. So the lawyers, it, wa it was problematic for the judiciary indeed, yeah. to say, because the laws provide for consent, mm. and it is assumed that it is consent upon entry. Yes. Mm. If you even look at rape cases and evidence required, it is about penetration. Is it forced 
penetration? Mm -hmm. Is it uh, normal penetration? Mm -hmm. But when you have already penetrated, what evidence yeah. do you get for mm. court that I told you to stop? Now, mm. we, what evidence do you it get? Really so we yeah. need to also have a balance on these issues because mm. we are making a law that has offenses mm. that need evidence in court. That's why mm. I'm saying we need to break ground okay. and meet each mm. other 50-50. Mm. The case was problematic and later people mm. talked to the parties to withdraw. Yeah. Mm. Because how do you determine rape mm. when there was no forced entry? The ingredients do not exist in our laws. Yeah. It, is, it is such a complex uh, kind of thing. Mm. Uh, we would have maybe to study also other jurisdictions yes, to see. Yes, beyond Uganda. Yes. Uh, mm. what Where they do have they do broke ground. Uh -huh, in such instances. Mm. And, and you're not talking about consent also. I've not addressed myself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we've arrived. <laughs> Particularly on the issue of marital rape, yes. Yes. Uh, you will correct me if finally marital rape was recognized in the sexual offenses bill, or was it not? Because then again, that's one. Th that it one is recognized. Yeah, that's because another. Because there should be consent. Even marriage is not mm. consent for mm. continuous sex. Yeah. I think we will have to wait for the for, for the act to mm. be sure to, 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 to be establish sure. what was removed and <laughs> what was not. <laughs> because right now we are dealing with a bill and we're, 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 what was sent on the other side. Yes, yeah, so. Yeah. Yes, but I agree with you. Maybe mm. one of the things that we would do on the show, because again, yes. issues of consent yeah. and sexual offences yes. are pertinent to women, yes. irrespective of the space that you're in. Yeah. Yes. Your position doesn't protect you from abuse. Yeah. Your yes. money doesn't protect it Your does, privilege yes. doesn't protect you. Yes. And so it's something that maybe we should we just have a show debate. dedicated mm. to it. Mm. But uh, coming to the close of this, of this of segment one, mm. what are some of the things that we have learned in the, from, the, from the past, looking at the history of the movement mm -hmm. into the current context in which it has evolved, mm -hmm. that one, we would like to carry forward as we build the movement, mm -hmm. but two, that we, would, that we really need to drop mm -hmm. because, um, because there are certain things that we mm -hmm. must drop mm -hmm. if the movement mm -hmm. must grow. Mm -hmm. Yes, so who would like to go? Can I go first? Because yeah, I know when yeah. Sarah speaks, she will pre exhaust everything. <laughs> yes, please do. Yeah, uh, first mm. of all, I think one of the key things that we've learned is the policy or the government policy environment or mm. political environment has a very uh, strong impact on how we as women mm. organize. Yes. Just like I shared right from uh, after independence, how Obote's government affected women's organizing to the Amin's regime. And even right now where we are witnessing, you know, a pushback against civic, you know, civic organizing. Uh, th th this for me is something that we should learn from. Mm. If we know that the women's movement has always the dynamicism, you know, the dynamism mm. or the the vibrancy of the movement has always depended, you know, on the political waves or the yeah. political climate, then I think we need to sit down and strategize on new ways of organizing, particularly looking back to our strength, the inclusivity, mm -hmm. uh, looking at the new forums that we have, social media, and how young people are pushing, you know, for change on those different platforms, but also to maybe break away from over-reliancy on government policies like affirmative action. Mm. But how do we build ourselves up from the ground that the women are, first of all, they have the capacity to be able to compete on the direct seats, mm. that the women are able to organize even in the event that our, the, their organizations, let's say their yeah. bank accounts are frozen. Mm. I think those are some of the things that we have to, to look at. How do we creatively mm. navigate complex political and policy environments? Mm. The other thing um, would be uh, also to look at uh, movement building. Mm. Many times we say we are a movement, mm. but actually we are a fragmentation of organizations and individuals which are working on the women's movement. And we have not build a, built a critical mass mm. of, let's say, you know, we've not 
reached out to the women in the market, mostly those women, I always find those women have a lot of power yeah, and yes. agency and they've been mostly ignored. We go there, yes, but with project-based interventions, which are short term, yeah. but also which look at maybe how do we influence cleaning in the market and all that, but how do we build on those power. different constituencies yeah, yeah. and yes. the powers that they hold yeah. to be able to sustain the women's movement. Going back into schools, going to the women in the villages, yeah. going back to the church the, and to the, the mosque and, and to the yes, to the religious uh, spaces. Because, because again, that's the other thing. We have uh, the church which feels they have the women in the church mm -hmm. who feel they have been left out. Mm -hmm. But many times because we have not found or we have not established mm -hmm. some core values mm -hmm. where we say yes, we might disagree on this because again, we are not a homogeneous group. Yeah, As no, women, no. we are very Petrol, distinct. Yeah. Yes. individuals who are independent in thinking mm -hmm. we have the fire isabellas yes. and then we have the latent <laughs> rachels somewhere oh, so, <laughs> so yes we have to be able to create something <laughs> then you have the bombastic sars <laughs> i didn't want to, to go there <laughs> I didn't want to grab it. I, my <laughs> I didn't want because you know we might have but then <laughs> So yes, how do we yes, yes how do we leverage yeah ones, these yes. different strengths mm -hmm. but also finding a common ground? I don't know there is what which Sarah has been using, which was very interesting. Mm -hmm. Breaking 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 the ground. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, opening paths. Yes, so that we are able to walking. when we say it is concerning this, that mm. that will be an issue mm. that brings all of us together, mm. regardless of our religions, regardless of if we are, we belong to the feminist strand or yes. the, you know, the, the, the gender equality strand. Mm. So I think those are some of the ways that yes. we need and learnings that we can use to carry the movement forward. Thank you very much. And you know, that your last point uh, brings back memories of Woman 16. Remember the campaign around 16 women dying every day in oh, childbirth? Yes. And the, and, the, and the petition that Say had led on, mm -hmm. and the fact that it finally, we, we finally had a ruling uh, pro uh, getting government to pay attention to, mm -hmm. to, to, to women's mm -hmm. yes, to yeah. maternal mm -hmm. mortality right, mm -hmm. rates in this country. Mm -hmm. And it's strange that it took this long, up to yeah. the year 20 something, yeah. for us to have a ruling on this. And yet, I think that was one of the campaigns that had faces that had varied, varied faces, faces because yes. you had the face of the of, of, of the woman that society will ignore mm. in the market but then you also had the the faces of the people we saw on TV who mm. died in childbirth yes. and then the, and the, and the you know victims, the husbands, and the, 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 husbands the, the families yes, yes. and yes. so and so to say that movement building is saying there is an issue that affects women and all of us must be must, able to yeah. recognize this. When Sarah talks about mm. the aspect of education, mm. it is to say that whether or not I have had the privilege mm. of attaining education, I must be able to look at the girl who has never dreamt of yes. it and yeah. be able to yes. speak from yes. that perspective mm. because it is important that mm. girls be educated. Just a little, yes. just a little, like less than a minute, but I yes. love the fact that you have touched on our need to organizing around critical oh, issues yes. or pertinent, yes. Yes. Issues, yes. pertinent issues, issues yeah. that are affecting. I think many times, again, going back to our elitist <laughs> ac accusations, yeah. it is because when uh, particular issues that are affect women or that affect Ugandans of which women are part of Ugandans when they happen many times we have distanced ourselves mm. of course it's from the fear given the political environment that we are having right now sometimes you know self-preservation and self-censorship yes. mm. so we keep away but then I think we need to be very deliberate mm. in organizing around the pertinent issues that affect you know that those issues which affect the Ugandans that's how they will feel part of the movement over to you okay I want to associate myself with the outgoing comments all of them and add that the critical challenge we are faced with especially on women participation in decision making is political hijack if you look at the majority of women MPs, mm -hmm. they need godfathers. Oh, thank you. Okay. To go <laughs> through, they need godfathers <laughs> to go through the elections. Thank you. And these godfathers, 90% of them are male. Mm. So we have the male 
political leadership, mm. dictating as to who becomes a woman leader. Yes. Wow. It is a hijack of the political movement. Mm. We need to work to get the women movement out of the hands mm. of male political godfathers. Mm. And that's why it is not serving the causes of the common that's woman. The woman. Yeah. Because the women got parliament and they serve they the interests fathers. of their godfathers. I love this. It is a big challenge and together, collectively, going back to the grassroots, mm -hmm. we can recover the women movement and redirect its cause to serve the woman. Mm -hmm. And Thank this goes much. back to what I said, <laughs> you know, us relying yes. on government given yes. policies like affirmative mm. action. Mm. You know, there is a way uh, policies like affirmative action make you more like a receiver. Yeah. It takes away your agency. Tokenism. The tokenism, yes. So you are in a state of... We are to their mercy. Uh -huh. And you have to be grateful. Yes. You have, so you cannot question the powers Yes, that even be. when you question, uh -huh. we brought you We, we gave yeah. you women. What is your problem? <laughs> yes, as if we are yes. second class citizens. citizens. Yeah. Women yeah. in this country are not second no, class no, citizens. No, human beings. Yeah. Yes, we are human, human beings. beings. We do not want tokenism. We don't want to pay homage mm. to God the fathers. Uh -huh. We want to stand as women and promote the cause of women. Yes, thank I you love very much. <laughs> and coming to the end, <laughs> coming to the end of this segment, one of the things about movement building is that for a movement to be strong, it must it must grow organically. Okay, and so structures like um, like like civil society organizations can aid the growth of the movement. Uh, policies aid the growth of the movement, but it's key, it's important that we are making strides right from the grass, yeah. like from the foundational roots. Mm. The movement building, the, the movement, yeah. the, the women's movement is not elitist. It's not Kampala best. Mm. It should be a strand that runs through Kampala into our communities, into yes. our churches, yeah, yeah. Mm. into all our the areas schools. of influence, our schools, our homes, yes. our hospitals. Yes. It, it must be a strand that moves through all of that. Anything yeah. less than that kills the whole idea of it being a movement. Mm. And so if you're watching this, again, like I said at the beginning, Movement building can be likened to a train on a journey. There are people who have been on this journey for so long. There are people who will get off on the next train stop. There are people who will come on because they believe in this train journey on the next stop. But it's important that when you come onto this journey, you're all playing your part. Okay? If you're a writer, write about the movement and lend, you know, value to it. If you're a lawyer, break down the law so that people in the movement can be able to understand. If you work for a civil society organization and you have access to knowledge, share it, you know? If you belong to Mother's Union, okay? Have conversations beyond how to please the flowers in your compound, yeah. you know? <laughs> have conversations around how as a Mother's Union, you can redistribute power yes, because it's important that, in a family. yes, about the, the, the stability of the family and the stability of the, of the society mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And so I hope that we can have more women organizing. You don't have to come to us to organize. Mm -hmm. You can organize in your community, mm -hmm. do it. Yeah. We shall celebrate you, we shall clap for you, whether or not we know. We will acknowledge the work that you're doing. Mm. And so I hope that you've enjoyed this segment. And I hope that we will catch you in the next segment and also next week at the next show. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Sarah and Rachel. Thank you for being a great host. Yeah. Thank you, Isabella. Yeah.